welcome my colleagues and uh, students to welcome you for today's uh, special uh, activity. This is a uh, lecture organized by NCTS. It's a, a distinguished lecture series uh, on a special topic. Uh, so this is the, um, the second time we have this lecture this year uh, with you member. Last previously, in May, we have one on uh, professional way cosmology by uh, Misao Sasaki from uh, YTD. So this is the second uh, lecture today. Uh, today we are very, very happy and honored to have uh, Professor Carlo Pinica to be here with us. Carlo is a uh, professor of physics in uh, University of Leiden and also a uh, director of this. Oh, no. At, at least uh, a group leader of the uh, Institute of uh, Rorex. So I just asked him about this local. Uh, certainly recognize this uh, Lawrence Force and maybe maybe Lawrence Contraction here also in the local. Yeah. Uh, Carlo is a famous uh, uh, condensed matter theorist. Uh, he was awarded the uh, Spinoza Prize, uh, the, the highest honor in the uh, Lettonian uh, scientific uh, community. He's also a uh, academician of, of the Royal Society of uh, Science and Humanities uh, in Holland. Uh, in 1997, uh, there was a survey, and he was uh, one of the first, uh, top 300 uh, physicists uh, uh, with most citation for the previous uh, 16 years. So I wish I can be cl even <laughs> close to that. Yeah. But we are very happy for him to, to be here today. So he's also here not just for the uh, for the lecture, for the lecture, but also for tomorrow there will be a half day workshop uh, uh, with. Uh, Alan McDonald, who is there. And then on Friday, we have a uh, uh, international advisory committee. So they will take part and give us advice on the running of the center. So uh, I won't take you more time. Let's uh, give a big welcome to uh, Carlo. <laughs> Probably use this like this, right? But that works, right? Yeah, sure. Yes, it's a, it's a great pleasure for me to be back in Taiwan. And uh, I would like to tell you something about uh, a topic which is kind of recent, as much promise. Uh, I'm very excited by it. There are some recent experiments which I'll tell you about. And, and uh, it goes back a long time. So I'll, I'll tell you about Mr. Majoran, who lived uh, almost 100 years ago. But there's lots of new stuff. So, yeah, this is a bit the outline of, of, of the topics which I'll cover, but it'll be an introductory talk. So I'll go slowly, give you some of the basics, some of the experiments, and also I'll, I'll end with some sort of a promise. This, this last thing here is something which I'm very excited about at this very moment. It's research which I'm doing at this very moment, and so there will also be something for the future. If you want to interrupt me and ask a question while I'm talking, you should do that. Don't, don't. Just raise your hand, ask a question. And, and uh, it, will, it will make it more lively if you ask the questions during the talk than waiting until the very end. So the idea is that, that you understand what I'm telling you, but that's the idea. So if something is not clear, stop me. Yes, this is him. That's Ettore Majorana an Italian physicist who lived in the early 20th century. And um, he does not look too happy. <laughs> in fact, he had a troubled existence. And he's not someone to uh, imitate. He's not too happy. And he invented this, this notion of a of a particle, which we now call, in his honor, a Majorana particle. And you, you should imagine these are, we're talking 1920, 1930, when electrons and positrons were discovered. So this whole idea that a particle can have an antiparticle, which I think goes back to Dirac, that was, that was the time. Particle has antiparticle. And Dirac had this idea that particles have antiparticles because of mathematics. He had an equation, the Dirac equation, and this Dirac equation had two solutions. 
sometimes equations have two solutions. And one solution you recognize, that was an electron, but you had the other solution, and instead of, dismiss, instead of dismissing the other solution, you said the other solution is also a particle, which we don't know whether it exists, but I predict that it exists, and it's called an antiparticle, and it became the positron. And Majorana was not convinced by the math. He was not convinced by the math. And he said he was able to manipulate the equation so that there was only a single solution. And I said, perhaps particle and antiparticle is just the same, just the same particle. We're just fooling ourselves by thinking that it's a different particle. And in, in more technical terms, he said, there's a term in my equation which couples particle and antiparticle. Sometimes it looks like a particle, and then it looks like an antiparticle. So it's really the same system. It's really the same particle. Now, until today, we do not know whether nature makes use of this mechanism. Obviously, if, if a particle can be transformed into its antiparticle, it should have no charge, right? Because otherwise, there's conservation of charge, and that's kind of problematic. So you don't have neutral particles, and, and the neutrino would be an obvious candidate. And, and to this day, we're searching Experimentalists are searching for reactions where particle is converted into antiparticle. The, the technical term is uh, double beta decay. It's some, some process which, if it happens, then it means that the particle has, that the neutrino has been transformed into its anti neutrino, and so it's really the same particle. And, and to this day, we don't really know whether that happens, and it doesn't look too promising actually. But then something, another development happens in this century. And so this will not be a talk about particle physics. This will be a talk about developments in superconductors. And so what happened in superconductor is due to this other scientist who lived later in Majorana. He's a scientist from Ukraine, uh, Bogolyubov. He looks more happy, don't you think so? More secure with himself, perhaps not happy, but more, more secure, more confident, absolutely. That was Bogolyubov. And Bogolyubov thought of a particle, which we now call Bogolyubov particle, which is really Majorana's particle. A Bogolyubov particle is, is, it could be an electron, but it doesn't have to be an electron, it could also be well, we don't call it positron in this context, we call it a hole, but it's the same, the same thing. So an electron or a hole, electron is negative charge, a hole is positive charge. And you might say, well, if they have opposite charge, how could you have transitions? But in a superconductor, that's possible. And that was the discovery of Bogolyubov. He found a term in the Hamiltonian of a superconductor, which we now call delta. That's the, the, the symbol we use for it. It's sometimes called pair potential. And this pair potential can transform an electron into a hole. You might say, okay, if you do that, you lose 2e. Right? If an electron becomes a hole, you go from plus e to minus e to plus e. You lose or you gain 2e. And this is possible in a superconductor because a superconductor is a reservoir of charge 2e. And these charge 2e particles in superconductors are called Cooper pairs. You may have heard about them. And, and so because of this reservoir, there's no real difference between plus E or minus E. Yes, there is difference, but it's like a droplet in the ocean. Right? If you add a droplet to the ocean, the ocean doesn't care. And so if you add a Cooper pair to a superconductor, it doesn't care. And that's why this, this term delta can exist. It can make transitions between electrons and holes. Now, one of the, one of the consequences of this so if, if you've ever seen Dirac's theory of particles and antiparticles, you may have seen that the, the wave function of an electron is a complex wave function. And the wave function of the antiparticle is its complex conjugate. And so the, the wave equation for the whole is the, or the positron is the complex conjugate of the wave function of the electron. Now, Majorana's discovery was that you could have a real wave a real wave equation means that there's no complex number. It means that psi equals psi star. And so that's how mathematically 
Majorana arrives at the conclusion that particle could be antiparticle. So this means that, that if this is correct, it means that this this Bogoyubov uh, equation should be a real wave equation. Now this brings me back to to uh, the early days of quantum mechanics, way before my run. This goes back to the times of Schrödinger and Lorentz. When Schrödinger wrote down his wave equation, Schrödinger equation, it has an I. It has an I, right? It's I h bar the epsilon t. It has an I. Now, perhaps you're used to this Y, this I. He said, yes, of course it's there. But when Schrodinger first wrote down this wave equation, it was a revolution. Because physicists know about wave equations, Maxwell equations, for example. There's no I in Maxwell's equations. Why not? Well, they knew about complex numbers. It's not that somehow physicists hadn't realized that complex numbers were useful. And even in the Maxwell equations, you can fully transform them. It could be convenient to have the complex numbers, but it's a trick. Because Maxwell's equations derive describe electric fields, magnetic fields, these are real quantities. So there was somehow this idea that whenever you had an equation which had an I, it was a mathematical trick. They're called imaginary numbers for a reason. Right? Imaginary numbers means that they should not appear in nature. And so it was somehow understood that that the wave equation which Schrodinger equation had derived, here it is, that this I it's not good. It shouldn't be there. It's, it's, it's a deficiency. And probably if you think better, you see, now it's really gone. Now, there are various ways in which you can try to get rid of the I. And, and here's basically, so this is the solution of this wave equation. It's a plane wave. Plus or minus I k x, and then minus I e t. That's the particle. Now, the plus or minus I k x, that's the plane wave. It's kind of easy to get rid of the I there. You just take a superposition of a wave which moves to the right and a wave which moves to the left. You make a standing wave. Standing wave has a cosine or a sine, and so the I is gone. So this, this I here is, is harmless. You can easily get rid of it. This I is more problematic because this is the particle, the plus I is the antiparticle. And so to get rid of of this, you would have to make somehow a standing wave between particle and antiparticle, which of course is nonsense. Standing wave between particle and antiparticle doesn't mean anything. And that's why it was not even, it was not possible for Schrodinger to construct a real wave equation. And now, in a superconductor, this is allowed. So in a superconductor, you can have a standing wave between a particle and an antiparticle. And that's why the Bogoyubov equation, which is Schrodinger's equation for of your quasi particles is a real wave equation. How does it work? Well, the Hamiltonian, the Bogoyubov of Hamiltonian, is I times a real operator times a real matrix. And so if you plug it in here, the I cancels, see? and you end up with a real wave equation. So that's the magic, the magic of, of superconductors. Bogoyubov's magic. The Hamiltonian is a purely imaginary operator. You might remember that the Hamiltonian has to be Hermitian, right? So you might say, it's Hermitian, how can it be imaginary? It can be imaginary. It just means that it should be anti-symmetric. Right? Because Hermitian is complex conjugate transpose. So if it's purely imaginary and it's anti-symmetric, then it's your business. We'll come back to this towards the end of the talk. So all the magic about Majorana fermions in superconductors appears because we have only real wave, real wave functions. It is merely also suggests all kinds of applications because as you may, may be aware, there's lots of promise these days about using quantum mechanics in technology. Qubits, quantum computers. And one of the problems about quantum technology is that it's very Fragile. It's very sensitive to dephasing. Dephasing means that there are all kinds of reasons why the phase of an electron is not very well defined. It's not robust. But of course, if the wave function is real, the only phase factor is plus or minus one, right? The only phase factor which is allowed in the real axis is plus or minus one, and so it's much more robust than a complex phase factor. So you're somewhere in a complex plane and you can move around, and so. Majorana fermions are hoped or believed to be much more robust to dephasing than electrons. That's why they're in demand for quantum technology. So that's some of the promise, the, the, the application promise 
real wave equations are brilliant because they're insensitive to defacement. Now, all of this, I said, this is 21st century. It's not quite. It started at the very last year of the 20th century, 1999. The first superconducting Majorana state your kilts. I made reference to Boa Yubov, who did his research in the 1950s. But he would probably not have recognized what I said now. He never made the connection with Majorana. He certainly never wrote his wave equation as a real wave equation. He did not. The, the Bogumov equation is absolutely complex, and, and you have to make some transformation to make it real. In the same way, this is actually the same thing which Majorana did. He took the Dirac equation, which is complex, and he made a transformation to make it real. So what we've been doing is doing the same thing to the Bogumov equation. So in, the, in 1999, these papers appeared by Senton and Fisher and by Reading Green, which realized that, that Majorana physics would apply to superconductivity. These were theory papers. It would still take another decade or so before these things entered into the experimental realm. And, and that, this is where we are today. Today we are at the stage that these theory papers are now experimental reality. I'll show you some experiments in just a moment. So this is the first experiment. This is the first experiment, actually, which was suggested by, by, uh, by Reading Green. It's called the thermal quantum Hall effect. You take a superconductor, and you uh, make one side hot. Let's say this is uh, hot, this is cold. And now you need a special superconductor. And this makes reference to this thing which is called the quantum Hall effect. Quantum Hall effect applies to semiconductors, and it's the semiconductor where the current flows along the edge. A special semiconductor in a magnetic field where the current flows along the edge. And, and these superconductors exist. I'll, I'll show you an example in just a moment, but at least you can hope that they exist. Superconductors where the current flows entirely along the edge. So here's one edge state, moving in this direction, the other edge, the other edge it goes in the opposite direction. Because, because everything moves only in one direction, we call them chiral edge states. Chiral is a, is a technical term which we use for something which moves only in one direction. You may, if you, if you know about the quantum Hall effect, this will be familiar. In the quantum Hall effect, you will be talking about the quantization of the whole conductance. But this is a superconductor, and a superconductor is, is what it says, it's a superconductor. So it's like a short for electrical currents. So, in a superconductor, you cannot do these electrical measurements. It's just a short. But you can do thermal measurements. And so the thermal measurement is that you would have a, a, a thermal conductance. Where's my pointer? Sometimes I lose my pointer. Here it is. Thermal conductance, which says that you may, you may remember the quantum Hall effect. Right? The quantum Hall effect is easy. It says Hall conductance is a multiple of E squared over H. Unfortunately, if you have thermal transport, it's more miserable. And in fact, it's not as memorable. It's pi squared k squared t over 6h. Can't help it. So instead of e squared over h, we have this more miserable number. And there's something strange about this number. Look at the 6. See the number 6? This is very unfamiliar. Because the quantum of thermal conductance is supposed to have a 3. Here's a 3. It's supposed to be the universal quantum of thermal conductance. So why does it have a six? So this is very so this three is somehow universal. It's, it's the same for fermions, for bosons, for anions, it's the same for everything, except for myron fermions. Myron fermions have a six because in a loosely speaking sense, but I'll make this a little bit more precise in just a moment. In a loosely speaking sense, a myron fermion is half an electron. And, and the way to think about this is this. A conventional fermion is like a complex number. It's a complex wave function. Now, a complex number is two real numbers, right? It's the real part and the imaginary part. And if I have the Majorana fermion, I have only the real part. So I have only half of the complex number. And that's why the quantum of thermal conductance is half as large. So that's the signature. That's the thing you're looking for in an experiment. 
to find quantization of the thermal conductance with one half the quantum. Because if it's one half the quantum, you know you have one half of an electron, which is a minor. And this experiment was published just this year. For June 2018, the first experiment to, sh to observe the half integer conductance quantization of the thermal conductance. It's an experiment by, by the group in, in, at the Weizmann in Israel. It's not in a superconductor, so you might say, hey, this is strange. We're talking about superconductors. This is not a superconductor. This is a, a 2D electron gas. It's, it's, it's a semiconductor. And this goes back to this paper by Reading Green, this guy here. They showed that the fractional quantum Hall effect is mathematically, in, in the five half states, so in the half of Lander level, is mathematically equivalent to a superconductor. A highly non trivial, beautiful, foundational result. I, I could not possibly explain it here, but this is what they found that half the Lander level is equivalent to a superconductor. And, and, and so this was capitalized in this experiment here, where they observed this Majorana mode, which carries one half the quantum. Now you may see here that their thermal conductance is actually close to 2.5. That's because there are two other modes, which are conventional modes, conventional electronic modes. So you have two electronic modes, and then you have half a Majorana mode. Now there are many things about this experiment which we still do not understand. For example, why does it I mean, there's this 2.5, but then if you lower the temperature, it goes up. Why does it go up? And they have explanation for that. So, you know, like all these experiments, it's never the final word, but it's an it's a impressive next stage of, in the field. First demonstration of this effect, predicted by Reading Green in 1999, was observed just this year. Now, it's, these are incredibly difficult experiments. That's why it took so long. And the reason why it's so difficult is because what we want to do with nanostructures in a dilution refrigerator is electrical measurements. Every single measurement you know about at low temperatures in a nanoscale system is electrical measurements. And thermal measurements, just the whole idea of applying a temperature gradient over 10 nanometers in a dilution fridge is just completely miserable. A voltage gradient is simple. You just solder to context, hook it up to a battery, and you're done. So what you really want is an electrical signal, electrical signal of a Majorana mode. And, and uh, this exists. And this is something we predicted several years ago. It's not yet been observed. But, and this is the, again, there's a one and a half here. But it's not a quantization of electrical current, which, as I said, is not possible. Right? It's a superconductor. It's a short. So the, the conductance is infinite, if you wish. There's nothing to point as there. Conductance is infinite. It's the quantization of noise. This is kind of strange, right? You'd say, well, noise should be noise is noise. It can't be quantized. But here it's it's quantized. And, and there's a very simple way to understand this. Because this Majorana fermion, it's not an electron, it's not a hole. It's a superposition of electron and hole. Superposition is something which you have in quantum mechanics, which says that sometimes it's electron, sometimes it's a hole. It's an equal weight superposition. So the charge is zero. Right? The probability one half is an electron, the probability one half is a whole. Charge is zero. But the fluctuations are not zero. If something is plus one with probability one half and minus one with probability one half, the variance, the mean is zero, but the second moment, the variance, is one half. Right? Second moment is one half. But the second moment is one quarter. So the the, the RMS of that standard deviation is one half. And so this was the, 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 the prediction. You would have a quantum shock noise of one half times the quantum of shock noise. The quantum of shock noise is a little bit better than, than thermal conductance. It's e squared over h per electron volt. No experiments yet. If we can do computer simulations, here's a computer simulation. So this is some sort of Hamiltonian which supposedly describes the real thing. And I plot here the uh, shock noise power, the PDV, as a function of voltage. And you see it's beautifully quantized at one half, all the way up to the gap. This is the superconducting gap, and then, then, then it dies. So this should be a robust signature. The robust signature of a 
Meyer anode, the purely electrical signature of a Meyer anode, valid at low temperatures, but the temperature need not be that low. This also the, the, depends on the scale of the gap. If the gap is one Kelvin, you can go up to one Kelvin. There's something else to note here. Usually when you do sophisticated experiments, sophisticated quantum experiments, there's this notion that decoherence is your enemy. And so temperature and voltage should be low. And the energy scale for how low is called after thousands. It's called the thousand energy. So thousand energy is a characteristic energy scale in metals which says you can only expect quantum effects if your voltage and your temperature is smaller than a thousand energy. Now, I integrated the thousand energies here. You see, nothing happens at the thousand energy. And this shows this brilliant thing that these particles cannot decohere. So all the conventional things we know about decoherence and low temperatures, low voltages no longer applies. You can go up to way, way larger way larger voltages and temperatures and nothing happens. And that's because there's no decoherence. That's why I like a lot. It's a computer simulation. I like it a lot because it shows this very fundamental thing. We're halfway. No questions yet. It's not good. It's OK. You can interrupt me if you want to. There's a question there. Please. I know this tend to the previous page. So what's the difference between pain and disorder in that? Well, another thing, so one thing I wanted to demonstrate here is that there's no sensitivity to the coherence. But I also want to show that it's that your sample doesn't have to be clean. So we added dirt. And actually this is something which you can understand kind of easy. It's the same in quantum hall effects. You have these edge channels moving in one direction. And the ones which move in the other direction are far away at the other edge. And so this order won't do anything because it keeps on moving. It's like a highway. Everything is moving in one direction. So this is a, this is a more mundane thing. We're, we know about this stuff. That, that this order shouldn't make an effect for quantum Hall effect for this conversation. So I think it's a very robust signal. Thank you. So if there are more questions, just go on and interrupt me. And, and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll get to the end in, in good time. Don't worry about that. OK. Half integer conductance. This is another question. Please. If I have this order, I should have many, many states inside. So that's the thing. So those have no contribution to the noise. Yes, so the, the question is here about this order, many, many states. Yes, but it's, uh, these are localized. It's very much like in the quantum Hall effect. So there will be many states also at the Fermi level. And they will be localized because it's. it's and, and the only conductor, you see, it's a superconductor. You, you might even be, quite, be concerned, how can there be superconductors gapped? And, and so the, the miraculous thing about this superconductor, it's called the chiral p superconductor, the miraculous thing about the superconductor is that it has gapless modes. But they're only at the edge. Oh, I see. So that the AST is topological. It's absolutely no, you need you need a okay, okay one reason of it, I'll, I'll show you the experiment. There's an experiment now. I'll show it in just a moment. But this is not a, con a garden variety superconductor. No, it's not. It's this thing which is called the Bartle superconductor, chiral P wave superconductor. There are many, many ways to do it. And I'm just going to show you one way to do it. And, and there's actually one experiment. So the, 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 the this, is, this is these are special experiments. I'm sorry, can I ask a question? This chunk line represents the first order phase transition. Excuse me? This chunk line represents the first no, it's just, order. No, it's just that you hit, the voltage hits the gap of the superconductor. Okay. So, not, not phase transition. Trip, trip. Okay. There's a gap, and now your voltage is bigger. Okay. So. OK, very good. No, you see, the first thing, the courageous person over there asked the question, and a lot of people say to you, just ask the question. I'm also not scared to ask the question. So go on and ask more questions. I, I encourage them. Good. Hatton, you had another question, please. I think this experiment basically are done in this way to look at it. No, OK, so this is a, first of all, this is a computer simulation. It's not an experiment. Oh, okay. And no, this the Hamiltonian here was a, a Picaro p superconductor. OK. I'll show you an experiment in just a moment. In fact, that's exactly the next thing which I'm going to do now. And here's the experiment. Lots of authors. Experiment, right? Famous experiment. Published last year in science. Um, 
and we recognize two words. That's a chiral, minor and fermion, node. And then it says how they do it. So yes, it's a superconductor, but that's not enough because you need to you need to do the special stuff. And they do the special stuff by depositing the superconductor on another material, which is a topological insulator. It's called a quantum level hard insulator. So it's some special material which which gives the superconductor the special property that there are gapless edge states. Why? That, that, that would carry me way too far. This is a big field of topological insulators, but it, it's, a, it's a great discovery by, this was a discovery by, uh, here it is, Su Chen Zhang and his group. So Su Chen Zhang found this route towards chiral period superconductivity, which was a practical route. Instead of hunting for a real chiral period superconductor, strontium glutinate, instead of hunting for this material which has not materialized, he said, let's engineer it by making a hybrid system, this quantum knowledge hall insulator, and conventional superconductor. And it seems to work. So let me show you the, OK, you're probably going to skip the angel. I, I, if, you, if you want, at some moment, you ask me a question about angels, I'll tell you about angels. But I'm not even sure about angels or something from, from OK, there's angels. But anyway, if you type in, in Google, angel particle, you'll, you'll see lots of things. Okay, this was the experiment. So what was the experiment? They measured, they didn't measure one half shot noise. I would have liked them to measure one half shot noise. It's not what they've done. They've done another experiment. They've measured one half conductance quantization. I told you that this superconductor acts like a short, so they had a somewhat ingenious setup where they inject an electron like here. And the electron is then reflected or transmitted as a Majorana fermion. So it has a super, equal weight superposition between electron and hole. And because this thing here is neutral, and this thing is ultra neutral, their hole conductance is not one, but one half. And, and here you see the experiment, and that's indeed what you, what, what you see, see, seem to show. This is one half, and there's a plateau region. It's not a very good plateau region, but there's some noticeable plateau region where the conductance is one. I have a question mark here. Like, like any experiment, right? There are question marks. And, and it's, that's part of our job as theorists in particular to raise these questions, right? So this is not criticism, this is our job. To raise questions, there will be new experiments, new experiments, more questions. And this is a, this particular question, which is that suppose it actually, so this is the claim in the experiment, right? That what they're seeing is a coherent superposition of electron and hole. This is the binary mode. Electron plus hole get divided by square root. Coherent superposition of electron and hole. But what if it's an incoherent superposition? What if it's just, for some reason, it could be an electron, or it could be a hole, but incoherent, you're an adding density matrices. If you've had a quantum mechanics course, you will recognize the difference. This is quantum mechanical superposition. This is classical superposition. It just means that there are some processes which sometimes it could be like and sometimes it could be a hole. You don't really know what it is. And, and this experiment has no way of distinguishing between the two. It has no way of distinguishing between the two because it's a phase insensitive experiment. It's phase insensitive. And so that's a weakness. And I even, uh, okay, here are the angels again. Here are the angels and the demons. I can tell you about angels and demons later if you want. So I suggested one experiment, which would be an interferometric experiment. So the only way we can, the only way in physics we can distinguish coherent from incoherent superpositions is by doing interference experiments. And now this is special because I told you that the wave function has no phase. So if it has no phase, you might say, what do you mean by an interferometric experiment? But that's a plus or minus one. And there's a technical term for this. We call this a, it's, it's a fancy word. We call this a Z2 interferometer. Z2 is, is, is a mathematical way for saying plus or minus 1. It, it's, it's just silly jargon. I think Charlie Kane invented the jargon, I don't know, or Marcus Kutcher, I don't know. We, this, the technical term is Z2 interferometer. So it's, a, it's an interferometer, but there are only two outcomes. Either, either it's plus 1 or minus 1, and, and these are the two possibilities. And, and this would be a unique signature. The Z2 interferometric experiment, there's no way you can fake that. It's almost by definition. It's a definition of a minor 
So it's a little bit different from the, from the, from the experiment which, which I showed you a moment ago here. Because here the, the superconductor covers everything, right? The superconductor covers everything. And what I'm proposing is that the superconductor only covers half. Now, as a theorist, I say, it's kind of easy, right? Just cover half. But that's not how it works, actually. For experimentalists, this is not easy at all. But this is the way to do it. Because now you see there are two pathways. There's one which goes around like this, and there's one which goes around like this. And they recombine, and so now we have an interference experiment. So it's a modification of the experiment which would immediately, immediately tell you whether it's coherent or incoherent. Good. So question. Yes. Um, yeah. So if this is the case, then what is the signature of this, um, you know, uh, uh, the conductance condensation? Yes. So, is so the, exactly the same? So here, here the signature would be that depending on whether there is a vortex, these are superconductors. Superconductors can have vortices. Depending on whether there is a vortex here inside. The vortex is a magnetic field which penetrates through the superconductor with a flux line of H over 3. Depending on whether the number of vortices is even or odd, you either have the IDV, which is the conductance quantum, or you have zero the IDV. So this will be a, basically what happens is it's, 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 the, what happens is this: the electron comes in. Here it goes. The electron comes in splits into two Majorana modes and then either recombines as an electron if it encloses an even number of vortices or recombines as a whole if it encloses an odd number of vortices. So zero or one? Well, electron goes to electron or electron goes to whole. If electron goes to electron, it means that there's no charge lost, so the current through the superconductor is zero. If electron goes to whole, you've lost 2E, yes. which you would then measure as a current going into the superconductor. So the, the experiment is, is kind of straightforward and probably will be done at some moment. I mean, these, all this you know, theory here evolves obviously way quicker. In fact, I also noticed here, so these are three theory papers. This is one critical theory. This was a commentary which I wrote for the Journal Club. This is one theory paper. This is another theory paper. And this is the theory rebuttal. So this is a theory paper by Xu Chen Zhang and his group rebutting the alternative explanation given. And, and, and you know, this is not a fight. I mean, this is not something we resolve by writing more papers. It's something we resolve by doing experiments. And our task as theorists is to propose the experiments, analyze them, and, and then after a while, consensus grows. So this is healthy. This is not. This is a healthy development in the field. Four, non in Britain. So this is a paper which, which I prepared for this meeting, right? I prepared for this meeting, so I have to have something really, really, really new. So I urged my group to complete the project so they can put it on the archive yesterday, which we did. So this, this uh, was on the archive uh, yesterday. And, and it's, it's a way to do this one thing which I haven't touched at all yet, which is non in Britain. If you're somehow into the business of my and fermions and so on, you say this is the holy grail. Every field needs needs its holy grail. Every field needs its holy grail. The holy grail of Majoranas is to do braiding. What is braiding? Braiding is again one of these consequences of, of a real wave equation. It's that if you take two particles and move one around each other. Typically, you have a phase factor, right? The phase factor could be minus one if it's fermions, could be plus one if it's bosons. It could even be a complex phase factor. But with Majorana, something strange happens. If two Majoranas move around each other, they exchange a particle. If two Majorana fermions move around each other, they exchange a particle. So it's not something that you can capture by a phase factor. It's, it's an operational state. And that's why it's called Non-abelian. Non-abelian means that it's not a phase factor. Phase factors you can just multiply, the order doesn't matter. But this operation of exchanging a particle is, is something that depends on the order, it's an operator, an operator's open. So this is all the technical jargon. But that, that's the totally new way in which these particles behave. They exchange a particle. And to see that in the laboratory is, is, is a quest. And there 
There's a whole bunch of groups trying that. And uh, the current proposals exist, and none of them has worked so far, so this is a new proposal. New proposal. Um, and all of this goes back to, to another paper by Nick Reed and Maura Reed, who were the first to, to realize and demonstrate that if you move Majoranas, if you exchange Majoranas, it's a non Euclidean operation. And the, 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 they actually did not think about these age bounds. That, that was a later development. They thought about Majorana, Majorana's bounds to vortices. That's, that's how they first appeared. So you would have a vortex, use a vortex, and this vortex can bind a state. It will be a, a mid gap state, it will be a state with zero energy. That's why the state is sometimes called the zero mode. All of this is technical jargon, but it's, it's helpful to, to keep this in mind. So it's a state right in the middle of the gap, which we see is zero energy, that's why it's called zero mode. And now you could imagine these vortices, and as theorists, we can certainly imagine that, that we take an STM or whatever, and we move one vortex around the other. That was their discovery. So if two vortices move, one moves around the other, they exchange a fermion. And you might say, why don't I say exchange an electron? It's because I don't know if it's an electron, it could also be a hole. That's just the thing about superconductors. You don't know if it's an electron or it's a hole. It could be anything. And so that's why in the field, we don't use the word electron, we try to avoid that by just saying, we say electron or hole, but that's too long, so we just say you exchange a fermion. So if, if one vortex moves around the other, it exchanges a fermion, that's not a phase factor, it's this operator. So that's why it's called non -equity. Now, this experiment, as you can imagine, exists only in the mind of theorists. Right? Take vortices, move one vortex around the other. Who knows? Perhaps someday it may be possible, but this is... So, there, there's a problem here. The problem is that minor, these minor and zero modes are immobile, and so to move one around the other is very difficult to imagine. How are you going to do that? So, Xu Zheng Zhang, the same Zhang has been encountered before, asked this question. Now I have these mobile Majoranas along the edge. They move all by themselves. Of course, they move along a straight line, but perhaps I can engineer the straight line such that they cross, make crossings, make overpasses. And then it's, it's done, right? Nature does it for us. It would be way, way easier, way easier. Nothing, they, they move around themselves. So that's a, a, an ingenious idea, and that's what we capitalize on. And there are some things to keep in mind here, because this sounds too easy, and this is too easy. And the thing to keep in mind, and that's one of these deep confusions which permeates this field. Every field has its confusions. And the first confusion which permeates this field is that a Majorana fermion cannot have non-abelian statistics. Because otherwise you wouldn't call it a fermion. Why do we call it a fermion? We call it a fermion because it's a fermion, right? So minor fermions behave just like electrons. Yeah, they have all kinds of other fun properties. They have real wave equation, uh, node coherence, and so on. But they're just fermions. They're just fermions. So this idea that, you know, I have this edge mode, my runner moves, let's make overpass, let's make them cross, whatever. It's too easy. It will not work. That's my conviction, and, and here this is, a, this is a topic of disagreement with, with uh, Professor Zhang, but that's healthy, right? I've tried to explain. Disagreement, disagreement in our community is good. It's good. So I don't think this will work, because my own fermions are fermions. In, in one of the correspondence that I had with Professor Zhang, we, at some moment, we decided that we we're not go, going further, and this is it. But he said, still, I encourage you to keep an open mind. Which is what I've done. So with Anton Achmerov, my, my student and our professor of we've kept an open mind, and we have another way of doing it. Because there is actually a way to have things move along an edge which do have non abelian statistics. And those are vortices. Now, this is somewhat unusual. Now, we know about vortices in the bulk of a superconductor, but then if you penetrate, why are they called vortices? They're called vortices because the phase 
of the superconductor winds by 2 pi as you move around it. So if you go around the vortex, the phase winds by 2 pi. So it doesn't do anything, right? If it winds by 2 pi, that's like nothing. 2 pi is this. But that comes something which is absolutely crucial to appreciate. When we talk about the phase of a vortex, we're referring to Cooper pairs. This is the phase, that's why it's called pair potential. It's about pairs. So two electrons accumulate a phase of two pi. But one electron accumulates only a phase of pi. Now, if I have a vortex sitting on the edge of the superconductor, here's the edge, there's a vortex sitting there. Yes, this vortex will be a phase winding of two pi for Cooper pairs, but it will be a phase jump of pi for electrons, for fermions. So a, a, uh, the, an edge vortex, how I call them, an edge vortex is a phase domain wall of pi. It's a minus sign. It's the only thing I'm allowed to do, remember, with my Uranus. The only phase shift I can give my Uranus is, is a minus sign. So when a Majorana fermion hits this edge vortex, it changes sign. For the rest, these are just conventional vortices. Zero modes, you can break them, you can do all your stuff. So, this idea, let's use chiral motion on the edge, almost works, but you should not apply it to Myron fermions, which are fermions. You should apply it to edge vortices. If you apply it to edge vortices, you're in business. Now, this is kind of unusual because you've never heard of edge vortices. So, how do you make an edge vortex? I don't have to, we inject the Myron fermion, just hook it up to a voltage source, inject the Myron fermion. How do I inject an edge vortex? So this is the idea, this is Anton Achmiel's idea. He came to me in April. He said, I, I know how to inject an edge vortex. It's, it's very, very simple. If you see that, you'll never forget it. You inject an edge vortex by using a Johnson junction. You take a Johnson junction. Johnson junction is some sort of weak link. Here it is. It's a weak link which separates two halves of the superconductor and which allows you to very controllably change the phase. There are basically two ways to change the phase, which go by the name of flux bias or voltage bias. So you can enclose this thing in what's called a squid ring, apply a magnetic field to change the phase, it's called flux bias. Or you can apply a voltage difference and a voltage pulse. The interval of the voltage pulse is the change in phase. So I do this and I increment the phase by 2 pi. Basically I'm not doing anything. Sometimes it's called a quantum phase. You increment the phase by 2 pi, so it's not. But if you increment the phase by 2 pi, it means that the phase along the edge should shift by pi. So you've created an edge vortex here and an edge vortex here. But these edge vortices are they're domain walls. They they're, not, they're not separate entities. They're domain walls for fermions. So if the fermions move, the domain wall will also move. So these edge vortices move. Here they go. So what I'm claiming is that the way to inject an edge vortex is to apply a flux bias or a phase bias across the Johnson junction. It's purely deterministic. It's a classical thing. It's classical physics. It's not a quantum process. There could be quantum reasons why vortices nucleate out of, out of vacuum. But it's a purely classical, it's deterministic on-demand process. That's what you want for breaking. So they move, right? You want to break. So here's, I, I'm now, eventually, and, and this is all working process, eventually I'll be braiding edge vortices. But for that, I have to somehow come up with some sort of insurgent edge structure. Now I'm doing the half, the half thing. I'm going to break this mobile vortex with an immobile bulk vortex. Now, what does braiding mean? And this was a, a discovery by Ivanov. He, he understood what braiding meant in the following way. If you have a vortex and the phase winds by 2 pi, this means there has to be a branch cut. A branch cut is what you need if a function go around and, and then you come back. And you've climbed the stairs and you've gone up by 2 pi, but you know you have to be at the ground floor, so you have to jump down. So you know, how you make the branch cut is totally up to you. It's kind of arbitrary, but you need it. So every vortex is associated with a branch cut. So when the edge vortex crosses the branch of the belt vortex, that's, that's braiding. And I do it here with world lines, that's, that's the convention in the fields. 
so you make both lines. This is time. This is coordinate y. Red is the, is the two is the two edge vortices. Blue is the bulk vortex, and I have overpass or underpass depending on whether one crosses the edge, crosses the branch cut, or does not cross the branch cut. This is called a, a braiding diagram. And so my prediction is that as the edge vortex, which I create here, crosses the branch cut of the bulk vortex, it exchanges a fermion. Now, there were no fermions around to begin with. This was just a superconductor in ground states. No particles, no fermions. So exchange a fermion can only mean that both acquire a fermion, because you can't just create a fermion out of nothing. So you basically, what it predicts is that you're breaking up a Cooper pair. You're breaking up a Cooper pair. One fermion will, will stay in the bulk, and the other fermion will propagate along the edge somewhere out to infinity, where I'm going to detect it. So this is the setup. This is not yet how you could detect it. This is how you could detect it. No, oh, didn't I show you how you could detect it? I didn't, okay, I didn't include the slide. Downstream, downstream, I'll have electrical contacts where I'm going to collect this fermion and it will show up as a voltage pulse or a charge pulse or a current pulse. So if you check out this, 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 this paper which I mentioned, you'll see the whole, the whole electrical circuit there. So this is some sort of experiment to braid a mobile vortex with an immobile vortex. If this works, next step will be to braid two mobile vortices. Perhaps we can build a full quantum computer using only edge modes. I'm not too sure about that. But you could certainly try and do key experiments using the fact that nature has given you a particle which moves by itself. Yes? So, so I just want to clarify. So what you propose here is that to do the braiding uh, is Mariana zero mole, uh, which is fun state is required, which is more useful than the, uh, the chiral edge mole of Mariana Fermia discovered by the previous experiment. Yeah, so Mariana Fermia's are fermions. They're useless for topological quantum computation, period. That's my claim. I think many would agree. Uh, so the thing which is useful for topological quantum computation is the thing which is called Mariana zero mode. It's unfortunate that we give the same name to them. It's unfortunate, but you know, this is how physics somehow evolves in a way which you did not. You, if you could go back in time, you'd say, well, gonna, please, let's use different names. So the thing which is useful for topological quantum computation is a zero mode. A zero mode is bound to vortices. Vortices are in the bulk and they're immobile. So what I propose to do is to use edge vortices, which are bi-phase boundaries at, at the edge. They move. If you know how to make them and how to detect them, then you're in business. And that's what this paper does. It gives you a proposal for how to make them and how to fuse them. That's a technical term and detect them. So I have two questions. So, you said, microphone. Sorry. So, yeah, um, so you have a fermions, and then it has to be a pair. And so that pair, how, how does that go again? Can you explain? Yeah, so what happens here, as this bulk vortex crosses, as the edge vortex crosses the bulk vortex, a Cooper pair in the bulk breaks up. One fermion in the Cooper pair propagates on the edge. Now you might say propagate along the upper and lower edge. That's the beauty. You don't know. It's shared by the two vortices. This is the topological protection of a topological qubit. If you don't know where the fermion is, and the other stays in the bulk. But it has to go through a region where, where it's getting. Well, yes, so this is the, the technical term here is a fermion parity switch, ground state fermion parity switch. So you start from a superconductor which has an even number of fermions in the ground state to a superconductor which has an odd number of fermions in the ground state. So this extra, fer this extra fermion which you've lost will be absorbed in the ground state of the superconductor. Now you object, you say, no, a superconductor has to have an even number of particles in the ground state. The answer is no. Topological superconductors can have an odd number of fermions in the ground state. So it's, it's a fermion parity switch. Oh, my second question is about the, the fact that you said for the vulnerability and the vortices. I agree that there is a distinction between those fermions and the vulnerability using anions. But what would you say about the uh, edge modes on semiconductor wires that people 
So would you accept them as the thing bound to the end point of the wire? Yeah. No, they're, they're totally, they're zero ones. So the, the existing experiments, we didn't talk about them at all. I, I mentioned vortices here, right? I said vortices here, but there's a, a related approach which uses not, so basically the term here is defect. So the zero is bound to a defect. Now a very natural defect in a superconductor is a vortex, but it's not the only defect. You could have the end point of a wire. You have a superconductor wire somewhere it ends. The end point is a defect. And so there are several experiments, not really by the groups in, in, in Delft and in, in, in Copenhagen, which do experiments on the end point of a wire. Again, immobile, I mean, the wire is not some wire which you can take and bend and twist somewhere in your fridge. And so they suffer from the same limitation which zero modes and vortices have, is that they're immobile objects. I want to use mobile objects, and for that, I want to use edge vortices. Let me conclude, and then we can have as many more questions as you want. Right? So that, that's a good idea, because then the, I'm, I'm exactly on time. So I'm going to conclude with this slide. Here. A letter from Schrodinger to Lawrence, the first professor of theoretical physics in Leiden. And people wrote letters, it is amazing. So what Schrodinger said, yes, it's indeed, Lawrence has objected that his wave equation was imaginary. He said, yeah, that, that's a problem, but uh, it will go away. Surely psi is fundamentally a real function. You know, this was the early days of quantum mechanics. And, 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 and this discovery, actually, Dyson, with a very eloquent, has, has uh, described it like this, that this was probably the genius of Schrodinger was where all the other people failed was to admit that he had a complex wave equation, the square root of minus one. And then uh, all of this, of course, was somehow in the past. And now we have a material, we call it the topological superconductor, <coughs> where actually Schrodinger's guess turns out, yes, there we have a fundamentally real wave function with a fundamentally real wave equation. And now we can explore all the stuff which, which in the last century, people thought it was impossible, which is quantum mechanics with real numbers. And, and uh, I'm sure I've just scratched the edge, scratched the surface, and, and I'm eager to continue this investigation. Thank you for your attention, and now we can have more discussion and questions as you wish. Thank you. Thank you very much. So can I say this is only work for topological quantum mechanics? Well, you need you need this Myron business, yeah. and and uh, it's the you could say it's the definition of the plasma superconductor. The definition of the plasma superconductor is a superconductor which has Myron effects. So yes. Yeah. Okay. So what is the relation between the uh, edge uh, vortices and the modular fermions? Could you maybe elaborate again? So yes. So Myron fermions are charge neutral particles, which propagate on the edge, and the fermions. So, well, the reason why they're special is that they're neither electron nor hole, but a coherent superposition of the electron hole, but they're fermions. An edge vortex, which is non-abelian, is a phase slip. It's, it's a collective degree of freedom, which actually, part of the problem which I have at this moment, is that I do not have a convenient kinetic equation for these phase slips. There exists a theory for these phase slips, it's called the Ising conformal field theory, which is difficult. It also seems to be overkill because I only wanted simple classical properties like how it moves or how it disperses. I'm not interested in quantum fluctuations, I only want simple things. So I don't want to use, I, try, I want to try to avoid to use the Ising conformal field theory, but it's certainly a collective degree of freedom. It's, it's, it's a phase boundary, so there are electrons to the left which have a positive sign, electrons to the right which have a negative sign. It's a collective degree of freedom, so there must be an efficient, semi-classical description of this domain wall. I don't have it yet, and this is my plan for a new future to find this. So when you say domain wall, you're thinking in one way. 1D, it's a 1D domain wall of the phases. I have an edge. A 1D phase. A 1D, it's a phase, phase boundary. It's a 1D phase boundary, yes. I have an edge, and, and everything to the left has positive sign, everything to the right has negative sign, and it moves with the fermions. It's 
because it's bound to the furnace. It's, it's, it's not an independent thing. So can you explain why does not bound to the, the junction? No, it's not bound to the junction. It, the, the junction is where you inject it. So you you, you need to apply a, you need to apply a, a superconducting phase shift to pi. If a superconducting phase shift to pi is pi for fermions. Now, how do you apply a superconducting phase shift of two pi to a superconductor? At a Jones injection. That's a, the definition of a Jones injection. It's something which allows you to manipulate the phase. So I take a Jones injunction, give it a phase twist of two pi. So I haven't done anything to the superconductor, but on the edge, I've given it a phase twist of pi. And this phase twist of pi, you see, why does it, you could say, why doesn't this phase shift of pi just stay fixed here? Why does it move? Well, it moves because everything on the edge moves. Now, you look puzzled, and you have reason to look puzzled, because what I would want to know is to be able to write down a bunch of equations for you. Right? Like, for example, if you say, I don't really understand this whole business of edge modes. I write down the Hamiltonian. I say, put it in mathematics, solve for the spectrum. I don't have that yet for the edge vortex. That's the problem I have at this moment. So this is, this is my, my goal. If somebody has it and they can teach me, which I would love to know about this, right? So I don't want to use the, the Ising conformal field theory. It seems way, way, way overkill. I want to use something semi-classical, which says this is how the uh, this is how this domain ball looks like. This is how it disperses. Perhaps it it's, it's disperses. Is it a solid? What happens if two domain walls meet? Uh, you know, all kinds of simple questions. I want to have an answer for them, and I'm pretty sure there is an answer. And, and when I find it, then I can do much more sophisticated stuff. I can really follow its dynamics and and and. And, and this is the unfortunate thing for the fermions we have. It's called Bolu, the Jan equation. It's a very efficient single particle formulation which tells me everything about the electric fermions. But it's useless, I think, for breaking. Yeah, one point you mentioned there, some inter long, uh, interaction between my run and my run. What is that? Yeah, so the interaction is, is it's a topological interaction, meaning what happens is that the interaction is when one Majora, when one zero mode crosses the branch cut of the other zero mode. So it's a long distance interaction because we are infinitely far away. It's, it's, okay. it's a topological interaction. It's not a, an interaction in the conventional sense of the world. Okay. So it's not, the, it's not a gauge. It's not a gauge. Well, it's gauge independent. Like I, I wrote here, I, I put it upwards. I could also put it downwards. Then it's the lower one which, which, which crosses it. So where, where you put the branch cut depends on your gauge, yes. Where you put the branch that depends on your gauge, eventually you'll find answers which will not depend on the gauge. But in this particular case, the question is the top one which braids or a lower one. So do I put this as an overpass and this as an underpass or the other way around that's gauge dependent and is irrelevant? So it's, it's this topological interaction which is, which is what makes it work. You mentioned about the electric transport measurement on the my one. Uh, can you comment? Can you comment a little bit on the spin dependent transport on the my one a little more? Yes. So spin is, is is good and not so relevant, I think. So first of all, all these edge modes I'm talking about here, they're non-degenerate. That's actually what you need. This 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 quantum model is holding into it. It's something which breaks the spin degeneracy. They're not an eigenstate of spin. I don't say it's spin up or spin down. Spin is not a good quantum number in the system. Spin is coupled to orbit. All these edge channels are not spin degenerate. It's very important. And so spin is some, there are all kinds of degrees of freedom, spin, orbit, valley, all kinds of degrees of freedom which enter into your microscopic description. So the moment I write down a microscopic Hamilton for this thing, which I do, and try to solve it on a computer, Spin will be there, orbits will be there, all kinds of division freedom will be there. But ultimately, I just tell you there's one edge mode. It's in some undefined spin state. It doesn't matter, don't worry about it. And then you could say, I'm not satisfied with that. I want to do spin resolved, whatever, spectroscopy, which is what you're doing actually with the Majoranas in the wires. There's lots of research on that. But for now, spin, the first approximation, spin is zero. Anything else? So is the edge voltage that you propose in this kind of setup also robust against uh, impurities? Well, 
I think it is because it's chiral. It moves in a chi it, it's chiral, so it also, also moves in one direction. And so there's not much which can happen to it. So the only, it's, it's a pi domain shift, right? So now it's very important, of course, that the wave function is real. If the wave function was complex, the pi phase shift could move anywhere in the complex plane. But if it's real, the only way you can kill it is by having two of, two of these vortices, two of these domain loss. Annihilate, fuse is the technical term, and it's done. But an isolated domain wall, by definition, I would say is stable. There's nothing you can do with it. That's my hope. There, there's lots of interesting, you know, big questions here, like how about uh, magnetic fluctuations, charge noise, does it really have topological protection? I mentioned this angel thing, and, and, and that's part of the, so, uh, Xu Qingzheng calls the minor and a fermion the angel particle. You know how it is with angels? I'm not sure whether they exist in your, let's say, worldview, but in, let's say, the European worldview, angels exist. At least, they're, they, they've been talked about. And the thing about angels is there, you cannot detect them by physics measurements. Everybody agrees on that. I mean, religious people and non-religious people agree that you cannot detect angels. They don't, they're not, they don't couple to electromagnetic radiation, for example. Right? So, or they don't couple to gravity. You cannot detect them by, and that's why, Physicists would say, if you, if you don't couple to any physics probe, they don't exist. And then other people say, well, I've, I've encountered angels. Okay. So, um, Xu Qingzheng coined the words, here it is, angel particle. I lost my angel particle. Here it is. I want to show you the angel particle. It's coming. Here it is. Angel particle for the minor firm. Both matter and antimatter. But the Maya fermion is, is not immune. You, it, it couples to, I mean, it's charge neutral, but it's not an eigenstate of charge. That's why it has shock noise, couples to like magnetic fluctuation, so you can detect it by all kinds of means, even though it's charge neutral. So I say it's not an angel. It's not an angel. <laughs> Edge vortex. That is the angel. It's by phase domain. domain. It doesn't exist. How, how is it detected? You cannot detect it. And you can encode this if you can detect it. Can you do anything useful with it? Yes. Because if you have two of these domain laws, you can encode a qubit in it in the same way you would encode a qubit into two minus zero modes. So it can store information non locally along the two edges, non locally. It can store information, you can calculate with it, but you cannot detect it. That, I think, is the angel. So my claim. I'm pretty sure Shuqian would not agree, but okay. it's something we could discuss about. My claim is that the angel particle of this experiment is not the myelin fermion, but the myelin zero mode, the edge vortex. That's my, my claim. And this is absolutely an angel. And it also shows that we should be very careful with saying if something cannot be detected by physical measurements, if it does not exist. This is an example of something which We've closed with angels. I think this is a very good time to end. Do you think this is a good time to end? Okay, so do you want one more question? Oh, okay. I, I'm around until Friday. Yeah, we have uh, some, uh, you've had some coffee and tea back to NCTS for fraud. So you're welcome to go there and continue the discussion. And uh, yeah, Carol will be around with you uh, this Friday, so please feel free to catch him.